All right, coming up is part four of the neural networking series where I attempt to tie everything together from parts one, two, and three. So if you haven't seen those, make sure you go check those out. Um, and in this video, I'm going to give you a more realistic example uh, for neural networks to really give you a better idea of how they work. Coming up. So first things first, let's take a look at our data set we're going to be working with here. Now, we're going to be attempting to use our neural network to predict diabetes. So some columns you might find are height, weight, body fat, sugar, and if they're a diabetic or not. Now let's go ahead and populate our data set with some data. Okay, so because all values in a neural network, all the data must be numerical, to represent whether or not someone's diabetic or not, we'll just use 0 or 1. The 1 means they're a diabetic, the 0 means they are not a diabetic. Now this column of zeros and ones under diabetic are our labels, also known as Y. Now labels are basically our answers, right? They're the column that we would like to predict. But in order to predict, we first need to train our neural network. And that means providing data that includes the answers. The other set of values, these are our inputs, also known as X. Now the inputs are the is the data we're going to be using to attempt to predict whether or not someone is diabetic, or to, to attempt to predict our labels. And this is the data that we'll use to train our neural network. Now let's walk through how a data set like this might be used to train a neural network. So let's add our data to the screen here. Now I removed sugar from the, our data set, but that was done purposely, just to make our screen a little cleaner and less confusing. Now the first thing we want to do is let's draw our input layer. Now we need one neuron per input data element. So as you can see, height, weight, and body fat. They each map to a neuron. Next, let's add our hidden layer. Now in this example, we'll just use two neurons to keep things neater. But in reality, this is really kind of a guessing game. There is no set um, answer for how many hidden neurons you'll need. It really depends on your data set, how many inputs you have, and really a lot of trial and error to see what the right combination is. But for this example, since we're mainly concerned about the mechanics here, we'll stick with two neurons. Now, let's draw our tensors. Remember, tensors are where connect neurons, and they contain our weights. We'll use red for the first hidden neuron, and blue for the second hidden neuron. Next, we're going to assign weights to our tensors. Now remember, weights start off as random. So let's add those to the tensors. And remember, the goal of training a neural network is to find the appropriate weights. But since we don't know that starting out, we assign them to random values, which we've done here. Next, let's add our bias. We'll use a value of one. Now, it's important to note here that bias, that value applies to, there's a single value for every tensor in that layer. So, all these tensors will use the same bias value. There is not a unique bias per weight, Instead, that bias, that single value, will be applied to all the weights, and you'll see how this works later. Now, let's calculate the value for our first node in our hidden layer. We'll call this node A1. So first we take our input, first input value of 50 times our first weight of 0.25 plus our second input value of 195 times our second weight of 0.15 plus our third input of 72 times our third weight of 0.1 then to that whole equation, we add our bias of 1, and that gives us a value of 49.95, also known as z. Next, that value of z gets passed to our sigmoid activation function, and you may remember this from the other videos. That results in a final activation value for our neuron of 0.99. Now the next step would be to calculate the activation value for the second neuron in our hidden layer, using the weights in blue this time. Now for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and calculate this for us. And this also gives us another value of 0.99. Now the next thing we want to do is, let's go ahead and draw the node in our output layer. We'll call this value A3. And we'll give it a bias of 1 and populate random weights. Now we're going to calculate our output neuron, or A3, the same way we calculate our other hidden neurons. Now I'll go ahead and put the equation up on the screen here. And as you can see, it's simply our A1 activation value of 0.99 times W7, our first weight in our output layer, of 0.25 plus 0.99, which is the activation of A2, 
times W8 or 0.15 plus our bias of 1. And that equals a value of 1.396. We pass that to our sigmoid activation for a final output value of 0.67. Now there's something I want to point out here, and that's that a sigmoid activation function will always return a value between 0 and 1. It will never return 1 exactly or 0 exactly. So you might be saying, well how can we predict our diabetic values of 1 if it's never going to return 1? And the answer to that is, typically the way sigmoid values are interpreted, they're interpreted as probability. So 0.67 means there's a 67% chance that we're correct. So this can be interpreted as any value greater than or equal to 0.5 equals 1, any value less than 0.5 equals 0. So you see, these, should, these values should really be interpreted as how confident our model is in the answer. If you remember from the last video, the next thing we want to do is calculate our loss, or how far off were we. So in this case, we would take 1, which is the expected output, or the answer that we should have gotten, but we actually got 0.67, so we subtract those two. That gives us 0.33. Now, it's common to take that value and then square it. This is called the squared error. The reason for doing this is that it removes negative values and will also penalize our model the more off we are, right? So the greater the distance between our predicted value and our expected value, the more our model will be penalized or the higher our error will be because the value's been squared. So now that we've calculated the loss for the first example in our data set, the next thing to do would be to move on to the next example in our data set. We would then substitute those values into our input layer and then calculate our activations the same exact way all over again. And this would give us a final output, again, of 0.67. We would then calculate our loss, which would be 0 minus 0.67 squared, gives us a final value of 0.2. Now that we've finished processing all of our training examples, the next thing to do would be to calculate our total loss by simply adding the losses from both our training examples. So 0.11 plus 0.2 equals 0.31. The next thing that we do is take our total loss of 0.31, divide by the number of training examples, which is 2, and that gives us a total mean squared error of 0.155. Now mean squared error is the common method for calculating the total error. Then we would update our weights and repeat the process all over again. And hopefully our error, or total loss, gets lower and lower each time until we're left with a model that can successfully predict diabetics. Now hopefully this more realistic example gives you a better idea of how neural networks work and how really, more specifically, how training works and how they improve accuracy over time by adjusting the weights. But that leaves the open question, how do they adjust the weights? I'll cover that in the next video and explain the process of backpropagation. All right, so that'll do it. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. And also check out jamestechtips.com for more BI-related content. And thanks for watching.